commander. <laughs> hey, can I be part of your um, ladies' roast? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from uh, Minneapolis, we are very happy to have Ian Freckham with us. Um, he's been working as a quality uh, controller or the, director of, the director of sensory analysis for Cafe and Ports in uh, Minneapolis for some years. And um, he was hired by the directors for Cafe and Ports. He's also been a practicing Zen Buddhist monk for many years. And they thought that some of that practice could be brought into the way of uh, practicing sensory cuppings and conducting quality control. So most of the time, Ian never travels to consuming countries. Uh, he would actually mostly go to producing countries um, to sort of uh, do the quality control and also arrange the, the cuppings at Cafe Imports. So we are very happy that we could get him over here because he knows a lot about uh, the new black that everybody talks about. Nobody knows much about it. neither is the water activity. And uh, <coughs> he's conducted some studies and uh, he's not very happy to make too many uh, close conclusions today as it's really sort of leading edge, cutting edge uh, research on the water activity and how it influences the quality of coffee, storage, etc. But I won't say any much more. I just welcome Jan Fredheim. Thank you very much. So this is water activity in green coffee. Um, we've been working on this for a little over two years now. And uh, as Jens said, it's cutting edge. It's also really not at all cutting edge. Uh, I'm often super curious why I'm doing this at all, to be honest, like why it hasn't already been done. Uh, people who have a lot of money in the game in food and commodities and food production they do this. This is like, it's set. This is what they do. Uh, and we're just getting going on it, so we're a little behind the ball on this particular uh, measurement, but we'll see. We'll see if we can catch up. The other thing is that uh, you can use water activity in green coffee in the same way that you can use it in other commodities. However, that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to... We have a novel application for water activity. That's what we're actually testing. We don't know if that is going to give us anything or not. Um, over the last two and a half years or so, we've gotten a little bit closer. Uh, what I'm gonna do is show you just exactly what we've seen. Uh, before we get there though, I've got a few things to go over. Um, first of all, some preliminaries on just presenting water activity. What that, you know, what went through my mind as uh, Tim, Tim asked me to come and talk to you all about this. Uh, thankfully, Tim sent some questions along. Very good questions. So we're going to go over those. We're going to look at them once here at the very beginning. Um, just so that you can have them in your mind as a lens. And then we'll circle back to them at the end uh, and go over them in more detail. Uh, we're going to need to have some baseline stuff. So what is water activity? How is water activity measured? History? Uh, as we get down to moisture migration, we're going to be getting a little bit closer to green coffee. As we get into respiration, we're going to be really talking about green coffee. I'm going to compare water activity and moisture content for you, how they're different, how they're similar. Uh, and then we're going to actually circle back into Tim's questions in, in some greater detail. Uh, if there's time, you, know, as you can let me know about that. We'll do some Q&A stuff. Uh, and then there's going to be a cupping. I've got six copies very demonstrative of what we've seen in water activity and what we're looking for with that. So.
So uh, some preliminary comments. And actually, it's interesting because today a number of things in this presentation have already come up in different contexts. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. That's kind of nice. Um, so it can be kind of boring. And what I mean is when we got started, I thought, man, we're going to take like some measurements and six months down the line, we're going to have answers and it's going to be sweet and write a blog post and it's going to be, people love it. Uh, that's what my bosses wanted too, I think. What we've seen are patterns and like fledgling, barely emerging patterns. They come up, you say, oh, there it is, and then you investigate it and it falls apart under data. So you get a new pattern. There it is, let's investigate it. Uh, little bursts of excitement and lots of data taking. So we've got theory, data, charts, and theory again. Theory number one, this is science of water activity. That's set, um, we're gonna spend some time going over it. Data, um, we'll look at that too. We've got quite a lot of data at this point. I've got two separate uh, data sets that I look at. Uh, the large one, the overall one, is 5,000 or so coffees. Um, for a coffee to get into the data set, it needs to have a cup score, a water activity measurement, and a moisture, uh, moisture content reading. Uh, the smaller set is longitudinal. Uh, I'll talk about what that is. And that, at this point, is, I think, something like 2,200, 2,400 coffees. Uh, I've got charts so that we're not just looking at numbers. And then theory number two, that's actually uh, our current working theories, where we think this is actually going to go, how it's going to be useful for uh, coffee roasters, especially coffee importing uh, industry in general. Um, so as I mentioned, the science of water activity itself is settled. Uh, people use it every day, all the time. <clears throat> and it's really interesting in the way that it is settled. Um, well, here we are, we're still in the preliminaries, so. The particular applications of water activity are not settled. Uh, that relates back to the very interesting point about water activity. It spans over different products in very key ways. However, how it behaves within each particular product is a little bit different. Uh, so this is a work in progress very much. If I say anything that sounds like too sure of myself, as pertains to coffee and water activity, uh, just take that with a grain of salt and realize that was a mistake on my part. Um, another little comment. I think, um, I don't know how many Americans are in the room. I, my personal opinion is that we tend sometimes to be like a little excitable uh, as a culture. Okay. Um, like, like we sometimes, we get excited and we maybe like sometimes have this tendency to over, overstate things. Um, I'm going to really try not to overstate water activity and green coffee here today. Um, so reasons for being a work in progress, sample size is huge here. Um, we were faced with the choice of sample size or like scientific lab work and we're not really set up to do truly scientific lab work, uh, controlling variables and selecting that kind of thing. We are set up to do massive sample sizing. I mean, right now we're cupping four days a week, 26 coffees a day. If we can just plug measurements into that, um, we can have a massive sample size in a year, two years, three years. So that was the route that we went. Plus, uh, sample sizing, it's more realistic when you take coffee out of our everyday uh, experience and put it in the lab and you know like demolish it and test for it an ester or something like that. It's interesting uh, and you can learn some things. But for what we want to do, we just we wanted to know uh, how does water activity affect score over time? When it comes down to it, we're happy to invest my time in studying this. And if it doesn't work out. If water activity won't predict score over time, then we kind of don't care. Um, sorry to the scientific water activity scientific community, but that was really where the uh, rubber was going to hit the road for us. Uh, so sample sizing takes time, longitude takes time. You get a pre-shipment, a pre-shipment or an offer. You, 
cup it, you take your measurements, and you've got some numbers, and you say, great, now we gotta wait. You gotta wait for it to arrive in your warehouse. You do it again, you say, great, now you gotta wait. You let it sit in your warehouse. If you're gonna find out anything of interest, um, we're looking at coffees from offer to spot, to spot, uh, sometimes a fourth place to spot. I'm cutting it off right now at one year for the most part. I'm really just looking up to about 200, 250 days. Uh, so there we are, approval, storage, and waiting. There's our numbers. Uh, so in the larger sample set, that's everything. That's just unsolicited offers. That's um, things that later we're gonna approve. That's rejections, that's everything. Uh, it's 5,200 copies. In the longitudinal study, I've got 2,200 copies. That's strictly uh, contracted copies, uh, copies that we have contracted and approved. So if we reject, we throw it out. Um, if I approve it, it goes into the smaller study, and then when it comes to our warehouse, it goes into our smaller study again. Uh, the reason for that is you can have, you can be buying micro lots, uh, you can be buying containers, and everywhere in between. If you are purchasing a container and it arrives at 84 points and that's what you contracted, that's great. I mean, that's to spec if it's what you contracted. If you're bringing a micro lot at 84 points, probably that's not what you contracted. Uh, so for a while, it's, it became difficult to sort those things out if 89 points and 84 points, depending on the contract and the coffee, are both good. Uh, this was a way to help me do that basically just saying, if we approved it, then we know it was too great when it started, uh, and we can work with it from there. So, um, this was brought up earlier today already. Confounding factors and statistical noise is a massive thing. We wanna know, where's my, there we are. What does water activity do to score, and also to score over time? However, as everyone, as you all know, there's tons of things that can go on. Shipment error, uh, roast variation, uh, possibly just moisture content, uh, coffee variety, coffee process, panel variation, uh, you name it, and it can affect the score over time. It's particularly since we're trying to use score, uh, cup score, as one of our determining factors. Um, a good example on panel variation that can come up is myself and my assistant cup, every cupping, I mean, unless someone's traveling, um, we have two, two or three cuppings a day, we cup all of them. So if we get 20 samples from um, one vendor, we'll say in Columbia, we're gonna split those 20 over two tables. Okay, so we'll have a morning and an afternoon cupping, 20, uh, 10 and 10. Uh, Megan and I will be in both of those cuppings. We'll have someone from sales, someone from sourcing, circling in to both of those cuppings. If Megan and I are very close on all of the coffees, uh, morning and afternoon, um, and the person who comes to the morning is, say, a point and a half higher than us across the board. The person who comes in the afternoon is a point and a half lower than us across the board. You're going to start to see a little skew in our results, uh, such that it looks like all the better coffees were on the first table, all the lesser coffees were on the second table. A point and a half uh, for each individual is not a bad thing. That's not a that's not a bad number, a bad result. The person in the morning is finding better stuff. The person in the afternoon. Is, is just finding slightly less good things, but they're not outlying numbers. So uh, what I'm saying is it's very easy to achieve inconsistent paneling, panel variation. Uh, so here we are, here's a little list. Processing, origin, variation, any conceivable reason that a